Welcome everybody to the Northern Electric Vehicle Experience. My name is Ron and I'm your host. Missed last week, but I was on vacation with my son. We, we drove uh, with my wife, my son, his girlfriend, all around Nova Scotia. It was a lot of fun. Got to see a lot of things we hadn't seen in a very long time. Uh, my son was born there, although we, he was raised in Ontario. He was born in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, when I was doing my uh, Navy time. I apologize for the last couple episodes' sound quality. I've been doing things to improve that in the last uh, little while, you know, putting some sound deadening in, into this room, uh, getting some uh, covers for the mic, and uh, basically just relearning how to do all this all over again. The last episode we, we got into is CCS dead. And the truth is, it's not dead yet. There are definitely holdouts, but you can see where it's going in North America. Uh, Nax is uh, the Tesla plug is definitely moving towards the standard. Uh, the Sharon organization, which does a lot with the uh, CCS standard or manages it, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, they're heavily involved with the CV CCS standard, has said they're after originally uh, saying that they're, uh, hey, no, we don't need any of that. Uh, they very quickly went, hey, wait a minute, uh, you know, wh whatever the industry thinks is best, we'll work with them and, and try to standardize it and make it all work better for everybody. As an organization, Sharon's main purpose, as far as I can gather, is uh, creating a, a vehicle standard so that all the all the players, whether they're charging equipment manufacturers, vehicle manufacturers, battery manufacturers, whatever, uh, that they all talk and interoperate with each other properly to try to put an end to some of these uh, charging hassles we're having. And I think that's a lot of the reason why people are moving to the uh, NAX standard is um, I think it is fundamentally a better uh, piece of equipment. It was not intended to be Tesla's thing at first. They were going to go with uh, this, what ended up becoming CCS, but CCS was too slow. Uh, they were getting a car into the market. So Tesla just said, well, okay, let's go with this thing. And they developed it, designed it, and went with it. And it just happens to be the best thing out there. Uh, it's very simple, it's compact, and it works incredibly well. It is very reliable. Now, in any charging environment, a lot of people, especially new uh, electric vehicle owners, will automatically blame their car um, for uh, a charging failure or they'll blame the charger for a car for a charging failure and it's often one or the other but it's often not the one you think it is or even why um, there's a lot of things that go into charging just because your plug fits or their plug fits into your socket does not mean it's going to necessarily work uh, especially with the latest models of vehicles each time a new model of vehicle gets produced, all the charging manufacturers kind of have to troubleshoot it to make sure there's no difficulties, make sure the handshake goes right and everything is perfect every time. Tesla tends to be about 100% reliable, mostly because they make the chargers, they make the cars, and it's a completely closed loop environment. Now, as we bring in non-Tesla vehicles into the supercharger network, I expect you're going to see more issues uh, with the non-Tesla vehicles at the superchargers. That is not to say that Tesla is going to be somehow sabotaging the thing. Uh, no, it's often just interoperability problems that have to get worked out, uh, and then they do, and then everything is fine. So if you if you or ever at a charging station and you fail to charge for some reason, uh, don't don't let that be a hang up on that particular provider forever. Um, if you need to charge, try again. You might find it works. Sometimes it's a very physical connection issue. Like uh, I drive a Chevy Bolt, as most of you know. Uh, it's a 2017. In that first year, and I think for 2018 as well, but don't quote me on that, they they built the the socket in the car a little bit differently. They didn't support it the same way as they do now. So it is actually a little bit of a weak support. So if you stick a, a heavy 320 kilowatt charging uh, cable on it, like CCS charging cable, like Electrify Canada um, is, is one of the bad ones for that, which is an, usually an ABB charger. It's a big, thick, heavy cable with a big, heavy CCS end on it. 
it actually will pull down the charger, angle it, uh, the socket a bit down, pull down the socket or the, uh, the plug, and you'll find it will not always engage. Like it'll say, oh, fail to engage or fail to start or fail to lock, some kind of terminology like that. What that is, is the weight of the handle and the cable is pulling it down so much that the locking mechanism to lock that handle to the car can't engage. The way around that is to literally hold the handle up while it locks. Once it locks, it's good to go. So if you get in that uh, situation, you're new, new to EVs and you find that you have that problem, just give that a try. It'll often solve the problem for you. I've encountered that at Electrify Canada. I've encountered that at uh, Petro Canada charging stations, Charge Point, I think, but not the Ivy stations because they've been mostly lower powered, but they're setting up new higher powered stations. So, anywho, um, never had an issue with flow, um, although they're mostly 50s, but they're also 100s and 120s. So, we're growing. As far as the NEX change goes, uh, we had a new uh, company come on board to the NEX switch, and that is uh, Rivian. That was pretty much expected. Rivian wanted to go NEX, I think, from the beginning. Um, But at the time, I don't think Tesla was all that open to it, and they've suddenly decided to become very open to um, the whole NEX for everybody thing. And they've they've taken steps to make it an open standard. They filed some documentation or whatever uh, to make it actually an open source uh, product. So let's hope that works as intended and that uh, everybody can now uh, connect or put those connectors on. Everybody can improve those things and uh, it can grow as the main charging standard uh, in North America and we can uh, we can grow from there. There's a lot of issues with with charging in non-Tesla charging stations, and a lot of people are excited that um, Tesla's decided to go next or to release next, and that companies like Ford, GM, and um, Rivian are deciding to jump on board. Hyundai apparently, or Hyundai, is apparently also uh, considering it, but they need to see on the Tesla end, um, that they support the 800 volt architecture of, uh, of, of their uh, GMP platform. It's, um, right now it doesn't support it. It's not that it won't support it. Uh, Tesla is working towards that goal. Uh, their version four superchargers will support 800 volt systems. Um, but they want to see a workaround or an upgrade path for the, vast majority of the superchargers out there that is like that are sitting at um you know like the the version threes um that can't deal with an 800 volt system so we're hoping that that happens soon and uh hyundai can make the commitment and then i assume that's kia as well uh then we need to start seeing the germans get uh, on board and we'll be uh will be a long way to where we need to be for it to be a, a given standard. As far as other issues with charging goes, um, failure rates are a big deal. Um, I found various companies are are really good at maintaining their equipment, keeping it more up, giving it more uptime. I've heard Tesla's great. I don't drive a Tesla, so I don't know, but I assume that it is true. Uh, it seems to be ubiquitous that uh, the Tesla experience is wonderful. I've had really good luck with um, Flow's uh, vehicles. I drive a, a Bolt, so a 50 kilowatt charger works just fine for me. And to be honest, it doesn't tax the uh, units very hard. When you start, you know, charging at 300 plus volts or amps, that's going to be a big deal. That's going to be hard to uh, for the unit to accommodate, and will cause more problems, as you can imagine. The General charging experience for most other uh, manufacturers is very hit and miss. Um, it'll generally work, um, but we don't have enough options. So if you've got, say, uh, company A's got one or two chargers at a location and that charger happens to be down for whatever reason, then on your road trip, you could be stuck. 
Now, you can find out about that using various apps, but uh, that uptime needs to happen uh, much more readily. I can see with some of the manufacturers, they're becoming better at designing their equipment to be repairable or if it's got, uh, say, five stacks or six stacks to be, you know, a 200, 250, whatever uh, kilowatt unit um, and one stack goes down, it doesn't necessarily fail the entire unit. It just isolates that stack and still operates that instead of 250, it'll operate at 225 or 200, whatever the the uh, math works out to. Um, also, they're designing them so that the stacks, the stack is basically a component uh, that builds the charging profile. Um, that's not the right terminology, but let's say um, a specific uh, vehicle needs 200 and 200 kilowatts, and this charger is capable of 300 kilowatts. Well, it will adjust the charging profile using those stacks to, to limit how much power is going to that vehicle, and then it'll sub-throttle uh, the power to, to suit what that particular vehicle can, can uh, accommodate, uh, which kind of moves me into another category of charging is a lot of people tend to think that if your car is, say, rated for 50 kilowatts, like the Bolt, and the charger is rated for 300 kilowatts, you think you can just go up there, plug in, and it will just pump 50 kilowatts. No problem. It's worth way more than that. Well, the truth is the car determines how many kilowatts gets supplied. Uh, the charger says, hey, I've got this much available, but the car says, I want this much or that much, or that much. And that's based on a number of factors. And a lot of it is temperature of the battery pack, the ability of the battery pack to cool the cool itself while it's charging, degradation of cells or other equipment, um, or how, how full the battery is, that kind of thing will affect how much power it can take at what time. Uh, a good place to check that kind of knowledge out is... Uh, uh, Tom Malogny's uh, State of Charge YouTube channel that will um, give you a very good insight on the charging profiles of various vehicles and various equipment. Um, he's got a whole plan, a whole program to benchmark each vehicle and each charger to each vehicle. Um, so you'll get a good idea how that goes. The last thing I'm going to talk about in terms of chargers is um, being careful to to choose chargers that have the correct um, certifications. You do not want chargers that um, are uncertified. Like you can pick up online uh, really cheap chargers um, that come from overseas uh, that have no certifications whatsoever. They may be just fine, but they also may melt down either you know, in your home or it might melt down the connection to the car. It might melt down the connection to the outlet. It might melt down your outlet. Either way, um, I would strongly advise you to make sure that that charger has a recognized uh, rating, either UL, ULC, or CSA here in North America, and particularly for us here in Canada. If you were to charge using a non-rated charger, in your home, it melts down and we have a catastrophic fire that destroys your vehicle and your home. If you've used a non-UL listed, non-CSA listed charger uh, or EVSC, as it's properly known, your insurance will tell you to go pound sand because that is no longer valid, right? So there's a lot of implications there you need to be aware of. If you want to know more about how to charge vehicles, the ins and outs of owning an electric car. You're new to the whole electric car thing. Um, go to the beginning of this podcast series, and the first few episodes are all about owning an electric vehicle in Canada. It's a few years old now, but it still pretty much holds up. Look for that. You'll like it. Flow. I touched on it a little bit, but they are, thanks to a loan from the Canadian government, are going to be putting in two thousand uh charging points in uh canada 
over the next couple of years. Um, that is a loan that um, it's worth uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, I think, that they have to pay back, but they pay it back based on the profitability of those charging stations. So if it's not profitable, they don't pay anything back. So that'll help them get us the equipment that we need and not have to pay for it, or pay it back, pay that loan back until such a time as they become high volume, high use and uh, highly profitable ventures. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Oh, I got a message in my message box today uh, or this week that I think is new. <laughs> I uh, listened to a, a podcast from another Canadian uh, EV podcaster, and that's um, True North EVs. And he must have heard me talking about how I want to get an Ionic 5 and what I think about the Ionic 5, and he had a comment uh, about that. So um, I'm just going to say that uh, you know I do like the True North EVs podcast, and I appreciate that he commented. And I hope he doesn't mind because uh, I'm going to put his comment right here in the podcast. Hey, this is James with uh, True North EV podcast. I actually did drive the Ionic 5. Well, uh, I guess here in Winnipeg, Manitoba at uh, Focus Hyundai. And great little car. I have a Kona Electric and the Ionic 5 was way better, way quieter, uh, way better traction. Uh, great vehicle for the price. It was the preferred rear wheel drive. Uh, yeah, I did do a review on my podcast for North EV. Uh, yeah, an awesome podcast. Quite enjoy it. Have a great day. Thank you, James, for that interesting tidbit on the Ionic 5. Um, and also, thank you for listening to the uh, Canadian Electric Vehicle Experience podcast. I find your podcast excellent. It gets in-depth. It uh, covers a lot more stuff, and it, it covers a unique experience uh, out there in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and, and basically the sort of western prairie experience of owning an EV, which must be challenging in the winter. I find his podcast excellent, and I, I encourage you to go check it out. As far as this podcast goes, um, we will be covering next week. I think I'm going to delve into a bit more about what's going on in the uh, Canadian battery building, mining, processing uh, stuff. So I'm going to have a probably a bit of a longer episode on, on that kind of thing. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, be sure to tune in to the next episode. Once again, thank you for listening.